Well, good morning. Our message for today comes from Psalm 128. Psalm 128, a song of ascents. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. You shall eat the fruit of the labour of your hands. You shall be blessed and it will be well with you. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your children will be like olive shoots around your table. Behold, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. The Lord bless you from Zion. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. May you see your children's children. Peace be upon you. So the title for today's message is From Vanity to Sanity. In our last visit to the Psalms in Psalm 127, we found Solomon, the world's leading expert on vanity, teaching us that every endeavour of ours, every care and concern of our hearts, every hour and every ounce of energy employed in anything without the Lord is vanity, which is desolating, useless idolatry. Well, this week we've got a change of perspective we're going to be looking from the opposite side of the matter. Um, it's going to be the same coin, as it were, but a flip of the coin. We're looking at the other side. It's the same value. It's the same coin, but from a different perspective. The dictionary defines sanity as thinking in a right and reasonable way. And that's what the psalmist is offering us this morning. A right and reasonable perspective on life. And it's all framed within one vital thing. And that is the fear of the Lord. He opens with this first verse. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord. And then again, uh, two thirds of the way through the psalm in verse four. Behold, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. And then the psalmist goes on to show us what life looks like for the one who fears the Lord. There's productivity at work. There's productivity and love and prosperity at home. And there's a healthy, heaven-bound perspective and then leaving a godly legacy when this life is done. So we're going to dig deeper into those themes this morning. And so we first have to answer the question, what does it mean to fear the Lord? We think of fear as a, a very negative thing, don't we? We think of the things that we don't like that, that scare us or make us ill at ease. I, I have fear where the dentist's chair is concerned. I have fear where the hospital waiting room is concerned. I have fear where the credit card statement is concerned. But here, fear of the Lord is portrayed as a good thing. So we need to explore what true fear of the Lord really means, what it looks like through the Bible's eyes. Let's just start in John chapter 18 and verse 3. When Jesus had spoken these words, I'm sorry, I'm actually reading from verse 1. John chapter 18, verse 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the brook Cedron, where was a garden into which he entered with his disciples. And Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place, for Jesus oft times resorted thither with his disciples. Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus saith unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. And then as soon as he said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. When the mob, which was led by Jesus, came hunting, sorry, when the mob, which was led by Judas, came hunting for Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus revealed to them his true identity. And sadly, most of our English translations lose it because they put in the words, I am he. And that's what I read to you even from the King James translation this morning. But actually, the original text, he didn't say, I am he. He said, I am. So when they came looking for Jesus of Nazareth, he says, I am. And uh, so he's telling them something very special about himself. He's actually revealing himself to be the God that Moses encountered in the wilderness when he was commanded to go to Egypt, to return to Egypt and pass on the message 
let my people go to Pharaoh. Let me just read that to you from Exodus chapter 3 and verse 13. Then Moses said to God, if they come to the people of Israel and I say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say to this people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. And so the Israelites associated the name I am with the one true living God, the God who met with Moses in the wilderness, the God of the Hebrews, the God who worked all those spectacular miracles in the land of Egypt, the one who spared his own people when he brought judgment on Egypt, when he saw the blood of a lamb painted on their doorpost, this same God who then led them out of the wilderness, through the wilderness, with a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day, then took them through the Red Sea, parted it for them, got them all safely through, while Pharaoh's army perished when they tried the same, and then fed them with manna from heaven, uh, gave them water from a rock. This is the God that the Israelites associate with the name I Am. They would understand that this is the God who is awesome. This is the God who is terrifying to his enemies. This is the God who is holy and commands his people to be holy. This is the God who will not share his glory with another. This is the God who alone is God. And so when Jesus identified himself as I am, he was revealing to them his true identity, the fact that he is God, the eternal creator God, become man, standing right in front of them. And just for a moment, as those who came to arrest him stood in front of Jesus, they realized exactly who they were dealing with. Almighty God, the great I am. And their reaction was to, to stumble backwards in terror, in, in a desire to, to put as much space between themselves and Jesus as possible. And in doing so, they, they, they tripped over their own feet and they fell to the floor. And that kind of terror, that response, that is our sort of default understanding of fear, of certainly the way we use it in English, isn't it? Terror of something that drives you to, to want to put as much distance between yourself and the thing that's scaring you as possible. But that's not true fear of the Lord, as the Bible portrays it. That's terror of the Lord and the desire to get away from him. There is fear of the Lord, which is shown in a very different way. I'm going to read to you, first of all, from Genesis chapter 17 and verse 1. Genesis chapter 17, verse 1. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Then Abraham fell on his face and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abraham, but your name shall be called Abraham. For you, I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful. I'll make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give you to, to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. So when God appeared to 99-year-old Abraham, Abraham didn't back away in terror, trying to get away from God, as the mob did when they pursued Jesus. Instead, he fell forward onto his face because he is... Yes, scared at a basic human level, but this is a, a fear driven by adoration and awe and wonder at this God who's not only powerful enough to establish a world-transforming eternal covenant, but also faithful enough and loving enough to keep that covenant and to enact it for Abraham's blessing and for the blessing of all who would come after him. So Abraham's fear of the Lord, it stemmed from awe and wonder and adoration and faith in God. It, it bowled him over, literally. It brought him to his knees and down onto his face. But it was fear based out of love and respect 
and adoration for God. Not fear driving him away from God, but fear causing him to love and worship God. So that was our first example. The second example is Peter in the New Testament, Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5 and verse 1. On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two boats by the lake. But the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out to the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we've toiled all night and took nothing. But at your word, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats, so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Peter's reaction to the nets being at breaking point because of the load of fish that they now contain. It is one of fear, but again, it's fear based in faith, like that of Abraham's. Now, it must have been faith, because when Jesus asked him to do something that was apparently unreasonable, to let his nets down, when he as a seasoned fisherman knew there was virtually no probability of any catch of fish, because he'd been at it all night and they'd not caught anything. But he did it nonetheless, because Jesus commanded him to. We can be great at following Jesus' commandments when they make sense, can't we? Uh, when we can see that there's going to be a, a likely positive outcome. It's much harder to obey Jesus when he asks us to do something that makes no sense. Or, or maybe he's asking us to do something that we've tried before and it didn't work. Or maybe he's asking at a time when the conditions just don't seem right. But look what happened when Peter threw reason and circumstance and logic and common sense out of the window in favour of faith. Not dumb faith, because he does express his opinion. He points out to Jesus the low probability, the low expectation of a result. And yet he obeys Jesus nonetheless. He obeys him despite the circumstances because he has faith in Jesus. Faith that is a right kind of fear. When, when, when Peter pulled the nets in with his uh, colleagues and saw those nets impossibly full of fish, he realised in whose presence he was standing. He was in the presence of Almighty God, the Lord Jesus Christ, the great I Am. Peter realised that he was in the presence of God become man. And he fell on his face. Now, he didn't try and run away like the mob. Instead, he said this, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. That's in verse 8. Peter knew full well that he was not worthy to be in the presence of holy, sinless God. And that's why he's on his face begging Jesus to go. He's not trying to run and hide but he didn't think it was right that the Lord should be so close to him, to one like him, so dirty as himself. But Jesus did not withdraw from Peter. Instead, he commissioned Peter. Let me just read this um, from verse 8 again. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' feet, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. So, Jesus commissioned Peter to follow him. Jesus, instead of leaving Peter, withdrawing from him, gave him a task to do, to change from being a fisherman to becoming a fisher of men. This is what happens when we hear and respond to the Lord Jesus Christ in faith and fear of God.
So there's two examples. The third example, our final example to understand fear of the Lord, is carrying on in the same passage. So Luke chapter 5, and now just carrying on from verse 12. While he was in one of the cities, there came a man full of leprosy. When he saw Jesus, he fell on his face and begged him, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. So this is following straight on from that account of Jesus uh, filling Peter's nets and Peter realising who Jesus is, wanting Jesus to go, but then being commissioned by Jesus. Now we have one who's not wanting to put space between himself and Jesus. He's wanting to come to Jesus for the cleansing that only Jesus can give. The leper was literally unclean in the sight of his peers. He was unclean in the sight of God. And yet he knew that the sinless son of God, Jesus, had the power to make him clean. Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. Terror of the Lord, such as the mob displayed, leads to that running and hiding, finding a rock somewhere in the darkness so we can't see how dirty we are. Fear of the Lord, however, leads one to, to trust Jesus and to pursue him for cleansing because you know that he is the only one who can do it. So terror causes one to run and hide, to get away from God at all costs, but fear of the Lord shows itself as, as confidence in his power, in his love, in his faithfulness. Fear of the Lord shows an awareness of our own uncleanness, but a confidence that as we come to him, he has the power and the desire to make us clean. So that's what fear of the Lord means in the sense that the psalmist talks about it this morning. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. Notice also that that fear of the Lord leads to activity. The mob were paralysed by fear. They stumbled backwards but then fell and were paralysed, weren't they? But those who fear the Lord are motivated to follow him and to walk in his ways. Excuse me. So the psalmist then goes on to show us with a very brief thumbnail sketch of what life is like for the one who fears the Lord. Now, for the sake of time, it will just have to be the briefest of surveys of this, but we're going to look very quickly at the blessings at work for the one who fears the Lord, the blessings at home for the one who fears the Lord, and the lasting legacy of godliness for the one who fears the Lord. So let's begin with blessings at work. Psalm 128 and verse 2. You shall eat the fruit of the labour of your hands, you shall be blessed and it will be well with you. We've seen the vanity of labouring without the Lord from Psalm 127. Now we see the blessing of labouring with the Lord, labouring in fear of the Lord. We see God-given, God fruitful productivity, which brings genuine satisfaction. You see, God didn't make us, believe it or not, to sit on the settee at home watching TV. When we do that, or when we're inactive, you know, we, we become bored, frustrated, and, and sadly people sometimes turn to some very dark pursuits, looking for some means of filling the time or some form of satisfaction. Well, we were designed by our Creator God to gain enjoyment and fulfilment through work which He gives to us. And that goes right back to God's original plan and purpose for mankind when he was uh, setting Adam and Eve to their task that he'd created for them in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work and keep it. That's Genesis 2.15. Work was God's gift to Adam and to Eve. They'd gained satisfaction and pleasure by tending the garden that God had created and set them in. It would be a delight to them and a reward for them with the fruits that it produced, which they could then delight in and eat themselves. And, and any of you that have any pleasure in gardening uh, will understand some of the joy that Adam and Eve had uh, and would have taken from tending this wonderful garden of God's. Sadly, it was quickly ruined, tainted uh, because of their disobedience in 
refusing to believe the word of God and instead listening to the lie of Satan in taking that fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And that, that sin brought all kinds of consequences to it. And, and one of them was the, the changing of the, the, the nature of this wonderful work that God had placed into the hands. This is what happened to it as a result of sin. Genesis chapter 3 verse 17. To Adam God said, because you've listened to the voice of your wife and not eaten of the and sorry, and eaten of the tree which I commanded you. Sorry, just fix my up. Let me read that again. And to Adam he said, Because you've listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you were dust, and to dust you shall return. That's from Genesis chapter 3, verses 17 to 19. So that joy of work that God had given to them as a gift, as a delight, it's sullied by sin. Productivity turned to futility, and fruitfulness turned to frustration. But as we saw in the case of Peter, Futility, frustration, fruitlessness in labour is reversed when we faithfully obey the commandment of the Lord Jesus Christ. When in fear of the Lord we do what he commands, and when we're doers of his word, not just hearers of it, the one who fears the Lord, there is in his labours fruitfulness and satisfaction. This year has been one of much frustration, hasn't it? And the labours of our hands and hearts seem to be restricted but if we continue to fear the Lord and to obey the commandment of his son, Jesus, he will put labours into our hands which are fruitful and bring us joy and satisfaction in serving him. We'll be fruitful at our work. Secondly then, there'll be blessings at home. Psalm 128 verse 3. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your children will be like olive shoots around your table. So this isn't a scriptural nod to the little lady at home. This is a reminder to the husband that when he is living in fear of the Lord, trusting him, loving him, serving him, his wife will be encouraged in her walk with the Lord and she too will be fruitful and productive. Listen to this very clear instruction husbands are given on the matter of looking after their wives. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendour, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Married men who live in genuine fear of the Lord love their wives as Christ loved the church. Yes, imperfectly in our case, with lots of slips along the way, because we, unlike the Lord Jesus Christ, are not perfect, but we should aspire to be Christ-like in all that we do in our relationship with our wives. Uh, knowing that, that that job won't be fully finished till the day we meet Jesus face to face, but for here and now, we should have that ambition and that our desire to love Christ and to treat our wives as he has treated us. All too often, and definitely in my own household, I'm afraid that the balance is completely reversed. It's, it's the godly wife who's encouraging the husband to walk worthy of the Lord. It's the godly wife praying for the husband, the godly wife, putting up and forgiving his many faults and failings, but continuing to set him a godly example. But it should be, according to the scripture, the husband as the head of the house, loving his wife and, 
and, and, and following that example of the Lord Jesus Christ, by, by lavishing upon his wife that same unconditional, inexhaustible supply of love that he himself has received from the Lord. And in that environment, the wife thrives and prospers. Her fruitfulness greatly increases. And if you want some idea of what that might look like, have a, a look perhaps later on in, in your own time today at Proverbs chapter 31, especially from verse 10 onwards. Now that passage there, it's not some lofty ideal for a woman to aim at. It's the God-given reality of a household where the godly wife is encouraged by her godly husband. And don't get me wrong, many godly women persist in a faithful walk with the Lord while their husbands are wandering away in the wilderness. But imagine what a household might look like when both husband and wife love the Lord with all their heart, with all their mind, and with all their strength. Imagine a household where the wife is daily encouraged by her husband as he loves her and sets a godly example for her. Now that might sound a bit like pie in the sky impossible, but it doesn't have to be so. When the husband genuinely fears the Lord, it will change, little by little, the way he acts and thinks in all areas, especially in his attitude towards his wife and towards his children. He will love them and care for them, following the example of the love that the Lord has given to him. And yes, I am definitely speaking to my own soul in this matter. So finally then, we have blessings that have an eternal value to them. Let's read Psalm 128 verses 5 and 6. The Lord bless you from Zion. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. May you see your children's children. Peace be upon Israel. The one who fears the Lord understands that the blessings in this lifetime don't come by chance or circumstance or as a result of my own ingenuity or my own hard work. All of these blessings come from God. And the, uh, Thomas, uh, Kent, the uh, 17th century hymn writer put it this way, Praise God from whom all blessings flow. You might want to look at the words of that. It's a very short hymn. You'll find it in Mission Praise number 557. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. The one who fears the Lord isn't constantly griping about not having enough or needing more, but recognises that provision is from the Lord, who supplies all our needs according to his riches in glory. And therefore, that one who knows that these things are provided by the Lord is satisfied. Psalm 23 verse 1 opens with these wonderful words. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That gotta have, gotta get voice is drowned out with praise for God who so generously provides our every need. We know that our bank account isn't kept afloat because of our employer or the government or a pension fund, but because of God who is Jehovah Jireh, my provider. The one who fears the Lord doesn't become trapped by material blessings, but, but keeps the heaven-bound perspective. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life, in verse 5. Now, at the time the psalm was written, it would have had that here and now connotation of the actual well-being of Jerusalem ahead of them. That's where they were heading on their walk uh, through the mountains, wasn't it? Uh, they wanted Jerusalem to be kept safe from their enemies so people could dwell there in peace and they could go there to worship God. But for us now in our time, seeing that we're not heading to the Middle East anytime soon to be in Jerusalem, I think it also has a heavenly perspective that we should take. So Revelation, Revelation chapter 21 verses 1 to 3. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man, he will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. The one who fears the Lord lives with the reassurance that this place is not home. We're merely pilgrims passing through. Our home is in the place which the Lord Jesus Christ has gone to prepare for us. It's a mansion in a heavenly city where we will see him face to face 
where we will have unrestricted access to the Lord Jesus and to our Heavenly Father. So if this lifetime lacks some of those material comforts that we might aspire to, whether it's a, a bigger 4K TV or a Power Mac computer or a Jaguar I-Pace on the drive outside, they, they don't need to give us a continual sense of dissatisfaction because we know that what is to come will be so much better and is absolutely guaranteed to the one who believes on the Lord Jesus Christ because he has said it will be so and he's almighty God who cannot lie. And our final thought with our perspective changing from vanity to sanity returns to children just as it did in the previous psalm. May you see your children's children. Peace be upon Israel. The one who fears the Lord leaves a lasting legacy. Maybe not millions of pounds and lots of material things, but much more valuable than that. A godly legacy. A legacy of children who themselves will grow into warriors for the Lord. They'll continue that victory march, heaven bound. They'll be bearing the standard of the Lord Jesus Christ, preaching the gospel to others as they make their journey. So whether those are our biological or adopted children, grandchildren, or whether they're the children that God blesses us with through our ministries, such as Sunday school and crusaders and lambs or going into the schools, passion for Kirby, all those amazing opportunities that he gives us to work with children. When we live in fear of the Lord, when we follow him faithfully, when we teach his word faithfully, when we set a credible, godly example for these children to follow, then they become our lasting legacy. When we're long gone to that place that Jesus has prepared for us, they will continue to make his name known. So here we have vanity turned to sanity. Fear of the Lord causes us not to try and run and hide from him, but to fall on our faces before him in love, wonder and praise. Fear of the Lord causes us to trust him and to run to him, to be cleansed by him and to be transformed by him. So blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. God bless you.